Um, uh, Henning Schulz Rinne. It's actually a, a great honor to introduce him. Professor Henning Schulz Rinne from Columbia University, New York, uh, is, uh, I guess, known to every one of us. He was also, besides being professor in New York, he also a form, was a former CTO at the U.S. Federal Communication Commission, the FCC, and he was a tech fellow recently at the U.S. Senate. And um, what actually comes more into into game here is that he is the inventor of the core voice over IP technologies such as RTP and ZIP. And it somehow feels a bit odd to welcome him using one of these non-standard tools now today, uh, but I guess he is uh, used to it. Um, recently, and we are not talking about uh, voice over IP here, recently Henning has become interested in IoT problems, uh, in particular the programming of, of large quantities, large scale uh, systems with uh, many devices. And this is what he will talk about to us, today to, uh, to us, about he will present ZenML for programming the IoT at scale. Welcome Henning, um, you already shared slides, uh, now they are gone again. Now we see slides. Hope we don't hear anything. Mute myself. Um, okay. I don't. I mean, I'm a mostly Zoom person, and so uh, WebEx is still a little new to me. Uh, so thank you um, for the kind introduction and certainly for an opportunity to talk about an ongoing research project uh, that I, my two of my PhD students and myself have been uh, pursuing for uh, a year or two in, in this particular form uh, in that. So uh, this is very much work in progress and I I look forward to your comments collectively because you've been working on aspects of this particular issue probably longer than that. Um, so let me maybe start back a little bit. Let's see why this doesn't work. Okay. Um, is it possible to enlarge the slides? Yeah, let me see why this isn't sharing just, you're supposed to be sharing, I'm supposing just to be, let me um, change this, see if I can, um, okay, is that better? That's great, yeah. Okay, let's see if I can still, uh, yep, right, that works. Okay, so I wanted to just point out something, this is more curiosity than directly related to what I'll be talking about, but I just illustrate how old the problem is. Uh, so some of you, and I'm, I'd be curious in doing the Q&A uh, to find out, my first exposure to what we would now call uh, the Internet of Things was really before there was really an internet, uh, namely uh, the X10 a uh, home network system, which was basically a power line, a very low bit rate, 50 bits per second style, uh, or 60 bits per second style um, in-home network um, for controlling devices. Very similar to what we now have via voice control and all the other devices that some of you are working on and working with. In that, again, this is started in the late 1970s in that. And clearly, when it was modestly successful, you could buy it at your local electronics store, so it wasn't too obscure, but it probably only attracted the hardcore geek community, generally speaking, uh, in that. But the problem there, even then, was how do you do something more interesting than just simply pushing a button on a device to turn on a light instead of flipping a light switch directly uh, in that. And all they had was an RS-232 serial port controller connected to a PC, uh, which was probably used by only a tiny fraction of installations at the time. Another one is that um, I have often seen that the term IoT is credited to various people that don't actually seem to have coined the term or uh, the concept. Uh, so I do like to give credit to the person who at least as best 
as the evidence supports, I uh, first named it uh, in a, it was not a technologist, was somebody who is uh, more on the policy side. I named like somebody who worked on uh, in in Washington, and uh, this dates back to 1985, so just a few years after that. So. Really, the concept, the notion, even though it probably didn't become mainstream uh, much later, really predates the web. Uh, so what we're doing really is, in some sense, an old story, uh, just recast into different technologies. The other more general remark that I'd like to make is that I find the term Internet thanks somewhat unhelpful. I uh, simply because it seems to span such a large set of applications uh, with very fuzzy boundaries. So that the problem set, for example, ones that my people are in my, that are attending this conference I might be concerned with is very different from what you might find that say at a smart city conference, which also nominally both fall into uh, the IOT space uh, and that. Uh, so, and we have the definitional problem uh, that it is so broad that people include things like printers as an IOT device. Hey, it's an actuator. It like, puts pixels on paper. Uh, in that, and it generally uh, falls into many of us has the same constraints, but in many ways, it's not terribly useful to uh, call a peripheral device like a printer uh, that's network connected an Internet of Things device uh, in that. Again, so we're talking for Internet of Things systems, really a range of qualifications. Uh, so from mobility that can be fixed to highly mobile, bandwidth that can man, range from 4K video streaming to man, a message every few weeks, like a, um, a word of some sort, uh, latency tolerance that's measured sometimes in minutes, um, some, like say some of the applications that people have been talking about for the swarm satellite systems, to something which is measured in milliseconds, say electric protection, I mean, grid protection, where you have to react in a um, cycle time in that. Uh, geography, um, as I will try to talk about, can span anything from a single home or a single apartment to uh, thousands of miles or a whole continent for some applications. And uh, in terms of the kind of cost constraints uh, that we work under, mine, it could be that we might have essentially no constraints because we are monitoring extremely exp expensive equipment where the IoT component is really just a tiny fraction. If I monitor a billion dollar bridge, I'm, I'm not too worried about whether I'm spending $100 or $200 on a monitoring device. Uh, on, on the other hand, if I monitor a vending machine I, that I have in a train station, then maybe I worry quite a bit about how much I pay per device or per year, say, on communication cost. So I'm, we are stuck with the term, but I actually find that the term often hides more and then it reveals, in particular, and some of you go back that far, is in during kind of my early PhD days when I, when while I was working on things like voice of IP, other people were working on wireless sensor networks as kind of a hot topic in that, and that had very different. I uh, it biased the field, I think, in ways that. Like tended to be towards one particular set of constraints that made didn't quite turn out to be as relevant as the research effort at the time indicated. So we tend to think I, on, I mean, as IoT, a classical one applications within the home, but they're not really typical. They are in many ways uninteresting from a networking or systems perspective, you have a single administrator, 
often these days you have a single vendor, even if it's not a single hardware vendor, you typically have a single systems integrator vendor, think Google, Apple, or uh, Amazon. Uh, security is modest simply because everybody can access everything um, and that hopefully only within the home as opposed to beyond that. Um, that's maybe not quite true either in some cases. Uh, and my devices with the exception maybe of a security camera tend to be a very low bitrate type of devices with very simple functionality and very modest reliability requirements. So um, probably the largest market for IoT as best as I can tell by, by euros or dollars, but in many ways not as interesting. And indeed, one of the things that has changed, I believe, and I value later your the thoughts on that, that if you were to go back a few years, the notion of an IoT network would pretty much look some version of that. Where the idea was Zigbee would take over and create a special purpose IoT mesh network in that, and then it would um, have a I, I, it would have a smart hub programmed by the user that would um, provide kind of a web interface and you would log in with your browser to control whatever your lock or whatever it happens to be in that. Right, so that didn't, as best as I can tell, that's really not what's been happening. In particular, I, and my, what, what is happening is that at the moment, as you probably know, and this is how we get into the programming part, is A, we don't do a whole lot of programming. Most of the systems that we have, with the exception of one I, I'll talk about as kind of a semi-successful attempt, is that every single device, unless you control it through Google or Amazon or Apple, is controlled by its own app. Uh, we have really not managed to integrate these applications into a single user interface, even within the same home. I mean, within this very simple environment uh, that we have is you pretty much have one app per vendor, certainly, that you happen to have in your home uh, in that. So I, mean, I think the reality that we have evolved towards is really, and I think the surprise probably certainly surprised me, as in if you'd asked to predict how the IoT network would, would practically look like, my sense is that my, I certainly didn't anticipate the emergence of the smart speaker as really the central component of um, particularly home IoT networks, as in that that become, became the hub that no longer exists, largely speaking, outside a fairly small hobbyist community um, and some legacy systems. I, that, I, that the smart speaker would become both the user interface and uh, the central point of control within the home, but largely controlled indirectly through the cl uh, cloud. I mean, as in uh, control is not local within the home network, typically it is uh, goes through a cloud a mechanism that goes back and forth uh, in and out, if you want to call it that. You know? So it's really different from what I think many of us anticipated uh, that would happen right? in the sense that these Vendors um, primarily in um, on Google and Amazon through the Alexa and Google Home environments have become the IoT controllers. So let me talk to turn to a different scale challenge. Um, again, it's not a term that I'm particularly fond of because it's been uh, hyped beyond kind of its ability to deliver, but it illustrates, I think, an interesting set of technical challenges that are probably more relevant to many of our interests. Uh, namely, what we generally call the smart city, namely the collection of public and public as in government owned, generally speaking, uh, private, uh, in-home, in-enterprise type of sensors and actuators and 
And the Smart City, while it is a collection of buildings and private residences, is not just simply a scaled up version of the smart home. Uh, we have to deal with strangers. Almost everybody is a stranger to us uh, in that. The number of actuators and sensors is scaled by factor a million, uh, potentially. And we have competing and or cooperating sectors like a local transportation authority, uh, a, a campus of a university, many, many homes, uh, and all of those have their own administrations with their own restrictions uh, and uh, policies in that. Ideally, I, and this has not happened, this has kind of been one of the reasons why I think the smart city has generally not delivered its promises that when are made in various EU proposals or uh, startup prospects, uh, is that it tends to be still siloed. Um, as the same sensors are used for one application um, only, uh, as opposed to being reused. Uh, and not. The goal, I believe, and this is where we get into the large scale programming part, is that we should think of these as generic devices that provide functionality that measure and actuate things, but they often have uh, applicability beyond a single purpose. Uh, and often use the same sensor data to measure different things or to both do short-term things like turn a traffic signal uh, red or green uh, and can measure um, longer-term uh, health of the city in various ways, traffic, noise, and so on. Uh, so the goal, I think, as we move forward is that we decouple the IoT functionality and software from, say, device identities. So if we think of this as an IoT ecosystem, a term that is sometimes used in this context, well, we have it consisting really of some living organisms, uh, namely the devices that are active, the users and the applications. Then we have some kind of non-living static type of things, namely the entities and attributes that generally don't change all that much. And they interact as a system. And I'll be talking about kind of some examples, really key parts of that going forward. So just to give you kind of a sense of the scale that that might entail for some uh, public or connected sensors that go beyond the home. Uh, so, uh, in the United States, we have about 136 million housing units or apartments and homes. So each one has an electric meter. So that kind of is a upper bound or kind of a indicator that we'll probably have roughly because there's additional ones for various uh, special purpose devices. So probably have about 200 million, I would guess, electric meters in the US. Um, we have lots of traffic lights, uh, but they aren't that really that many. Uh, so only a few tens of thousands. So that's not that large a group. Uh, we have many more uh, parking meters. Uh, so in the US alone, we have 5 million. That changes now as, as everywhere with these virtual parking meters. So that may not put, no longer be as interesting. And then obviously we got lots and lots of trucks and cars in the US, we have about 270 million in that. And then we have things like, again, street lights. Uh, depending on who you believe, it's somewhere in the 30 to 40 million range uh, in that. Uh, so uh, that's a large number, probably the single largest number of public electric devices at the moment uh, that, that we have. In that. I mean, the numbers are too large to treat as a home. Uh, but we're not, we're not talking billions and billions here either. Um, I'd be curious again if other people have number, I might mean, have ideas for other very large scale potential uh, devices that would be, or systems that would be affected by IoT or would be improved possibly by IoT uh, style technology in that those are the large ones that I could come up with that are public, not in an enterprise like a factory type of setting. So 
what are some of the goals as we talk about programming? The first, and I think most um, important foundation is to think about how we name the devices and functions that we actually want to control. I, my, this has become, my, even if you think of operating systems or programming languages, that's essentially foundational. Right? If you think of files and the naming uh, structure, or whether you have a more object-oriented or more a functional programming language, essentially it is one about how do you model the things that you want to control? How do you, in particular, name those in a way that is meaningful? And I'll talk more about that uh, in a minute. And indeed, that is central to the user interface, even at the user programming level. Namely, we just talk, generally speaking, about some named device that isn't really tied to directly to a physical device. device. I mean, those very simple naming systems, which are basically not really systems, are essentially a global namespace equivalent. I mean, kind of having global variables in a programming language, uh, in that, and there is no context notion, there is uh, no ownership notion, no access notion. It is essentially kind of the assembly language model with macros level of programming. Uh, in that, I mean, labels that you might have in an assembly language in that with no namespace is nothing. So that kind of works well enough, just like it did for small programs in assembly uh, and for in-home environments, simply because you typically only have one kitchen and it's obvious what the lights are as opposed to whatever else you might have there. The other one topic that I, I, is related to this is to where do programs execute? Uh, there has been a large, as many of you know, uh, a large research effort in kind of the applied computing community over the past few years, and broadly speaking, the notion of edge computing. I mean, it's been the subject of the whole conferences there for that topic. Um, lots of EU proposal and, and projects in that, all of that. So the idea here in particular, I think there's an opportunity to take computation to the outer edge of the network, as close to the data producer and consumer as possible. In particular, I see opportunities here to reduce privacy risks, data that you don't transmit, uh, can't be stored by people you don't trust. Um, it's important in some applications, not in all of them, to reduce network transmission. If you have LoRa, uh, it's nice not to transmit something uh, that you don't really, that nobody cares about. And I suspect uh, if you were to look at most IoT networks, most of the time, nobody cares about the data that's being produced. It's just not that interesting, uh, in, with very few exceptions. So what we want to be able to do is to aggregate and trigger our functions. And unlike much of the edge computing discussion that generally I mean, takes place more within kind of a 5G, 6G discussion, is we want to support small programming languages, my kind of a Java, JavaScript type of models, that motivated Java after all, uh, rather than say a full Docker stack, I mean, kind of containers type of thing. Importantly, I think, and this is one where IoT so far has fallen short, is I, the familiarity of programming interfaces matters. I, it, we can't rely, because of its broad spread across many different disciplines, on a small cadre of highly trained IoT programmers to make this all work. And I'll talk more about this in a minute. Um, as something that I think is underappreciated. We want to cover architectures from some reasonable set of devices. Different people will have different kind of lower and upper bounds, so to say. The lower bound is probably the more interesting one. Uh, and the question uh, that I think is a long-term one is namely, where do you put functionality? Do you put it, for example, in kind of a uh, local devices that have Wi-Fi access? Do you put it all the way down to a, um, a 
device without a kind of Linux class or similar real time operating system type one, or do you where do you move at? I think that's still uh, somewhat unclear, uh, and we are not clear yet on that. And very importantly, it has to work across multiple administrative domains. It cannot assume that a single administrator has kind of root privileges, so to say, for everything. So what do we have as program? Um, many of you know this, uh, but basically what we seem to have is largely three systems, namely HTTP, HTTPS, uh, hopefully in many cases, kind of a REST model with like get and put type of things, uh, tends to be device centric, maybe sometimes a gateway in between, mostly polling based, uh, a get, get the device thing, and maybe some uh, kind of kludgy event notification uh, approach with some uh, long polls and other stuff. And then we have co op as an attempt to create a mostly a lower complexity version of that. Again, um, my perception, um, that's not based on a whole lot of data, uh, is that it tends to be to the extent that's implemented uh, mostly polling based as well, kind of get input style stuff. So uh, the device doesn't typically initiate things. Uh, it is usually the controller that does this. Um, and then MQTT, which is obviously more of the event model and that, but the event model is very simple. Uh, it is just a simple, fairly I mean, a unstructured namespace for events uh, that I mean, you create. Uh, there's really uh, not much beyond that, beyond a, set, a single uh, string that you allow, or some hierarchical string that you can create. So, let me talk about the naming part first. Uh, so I'm not claiming that this is the only way to do naming, but I think it's a particular uh, naming exploration that is valuable, particularly in the um, IoT space. The reasoning to, again, is I want to get away from a, a API um, model that focuses on protocols. I don't want the program to know that there is HTTP or co-op or MQTT or anything like that involved. And I don't want the application program developer to have to understand any of these protocols at all. Generally speaking, that seems to be where networking has succeeded in the sense that um, we can Think of the evolution of networking, broadly speaking, as higher and higher abstraction level where fewer and fewer people actually know how the network works. That's not always a good idea. And I still teach a networking class because I believe that people, at least some subset of people, need to know how this stuff all works. Um, rather than treating it as just as magic. But uh, in general, we have moved uh, in the my kind of a large scale developer community, I believe, beyond kind of the early attempts like a socket API, which very much was mapped directly to the TCP state machine, I uh, choose something where, I mean, where you had to, for example, I uh, do your own DNS resolution and then I uh, used the output of that in the socket calls to uh, kind of a Java network API, which allows you to directly use names and has a direct uh, wrapper around HTTP um, to a kind of a web model similar much early on PHP. Obviously, that's now pretty universal across all of these web-based development or web-focused development languages or that at least have a root in that, that uh, application realm is that you didn't really have to worry about networks at all. We, your web server exported what was transported across the network just as script variables uh, in that. I mean, they became global variables or some other uh, interface in that. It was just another variable. Uh, and some we have then also, again, 
this is just kind of what I see as an initial version of that then spreads to all the common uh, web oriented development languages like say Python and so on. I uh, have a uh, much higher level of abstraction to that. Uh, so interfaces to my, what became uh, kind of curl and similar type of um, abstraction, particularly the HTTP. And we've also had the, mind the painful experience, and for some of us, that many good ideas for programming interfaces that have been developed over the years failed the program I hate test, as in uh, this was reasonably well designed, as in it worked, but it was just so cumbersome to use that people moved on as quickly as possible from that. You could argue that for voice of voice of IP space, there was a large Java effort uh, for that, which I, I suspect had more pages in the specification than it ever had programmers that actually used it. Um, and you had my kind of the predecessors of JSON style programming, uh, namely SOAP for uh, remote procedure calls in that, again, with high complexity, lots of setup effort, and probably not too many friends in that. And I think we are in the IoT space largely still stuck in these lower level abstractions. And this is a particular problem simply because most IoT programmers uh, will not be computer scientists. Uh, they will be data scientists. They will be city uh, kind of tech people, but not really computer scientists. They will be civil, civil engineers uh, that I mean, took a programming course in college. Uh, you know. But they're not professional software engineers. They have a job to do. Uh, they often need to develop relatively short-lived applications uh, to do some specific task, and as opposed to develop a whole kind of infrastructure. In that. And they certainly, in almost all cases, have no idea beyond kind of having kind of no letter combination. They won't probably even know, I mean, what MQTT or HTTP translate into both in terms of letter expansion or how these things work underneath. They just don't care, don't want to know, and we can't assume that they want to care. So if we think about naming in the IoT uh, space, we're kind of not in a great spot. Uh, we have essentially three models that seem to dominate and not beyond kind of the user facing things like kitchen lights type of thing. Namely, we address things by IP address. Uh, that's clearly my hard coding IP addresses into uh, my programs. I think I suspect all of us uh, would shudder at the thought and would, I mean, if we supervise students, tell students never to do that again. Uh, I've worked on a large scale electric utility system as part of a DAPA project. And to my non-surprise, but shock to some extent, is the large-scale utility networks, at least in the U.S., they named their electric control devices in, in their program and their user interface by their IP address uh, in uh, IPv4. Obviously, the IPv4 uh, 6 uh, hadn't quite entered. This was two years ago or so. Hadn't entered their mental space yet. but. Uh, and probably had the disadvantage from their perspective that uh, labels that look like IPv6 addresses uh, are not nice to work with. Uh, so, but it's the common way of doing it. It clearly is a bad idea. Uh, it, when we saw this, we had multiple utilities working together with multiple 192.168 spaces. We had lots of fun. Well, to unify those namespaces and make sure that the right device got one. Uh, the other one, which also um, is not uncommon in some version, you can, whether you do it directly as a MAC address or you do it as a GUID of some sort, kind of just dressed up um, in some other way, is clearly uh, also not working. Uh, so every time you swap out the hardware, um, you have 
your your program no longer works. So that's a bad idea. So most of us say, well, let's just use domain names. That seems like a much better idea. It's not an IP address directly, at least. Uh, it's m maybe even meaningful in that, but often because of the scale, people can't name every device in some way. So the device naming tends to be some obscure internal my combination of whatever the sysadmin came up with. And in particular, you have no idea often what the device name is derived from. Might, might be convention if you're lucky, uh, but it could just simply be some automated translation from an IP address uh, in that. So, you don't really have a good opportunity to program reliably in that because your the device that you're controlling could just leave at any time, uh, in that, or could change names at any time, or uh, even worse, a device uh, that I, I mean that you thought was one thing suddenly some other another device gets assigned that name because it gets that IP address. Uh, gets a automatically derived domain name based on an IP address, and suddenly you're controlling a different device than you thought you were controlling, with obviously potentially dire uh, consequences in that. So what do we want to do at the program level is that clearly all of those simple techniques don't work. At, I mean, at best don't work, and I mean, at worst could actually kill somebody. So, we want no hardware or network topology dependence. If I change the network uh, to a different provider, for example, uh, meaning I get a new IPv6 prefix, for example, I don't want to change all my programs. I need to be able to do this across administrative domains. Uh, I may not need to do it initially. It's the usual thing is it happens later in some way because of my interactions with vendors and so on. I want to have the semantics that are meaningful to programmers. I, I want to be able to spot that this doesn't quite look right uh, in that, as opposed to having to remember what this device name means and what this is and not being able to tell that I made a typo. Um, if possible, I want to be able to address more than one device in the same logical way where that makes sense. So for example, I don't want to have to, I, go through every single device if I want to, say, get their data or set them all to a known state. I, I want to fail gracefully, but I want to fail uh, in, a, my, in a way that is noticeable as opposed to silent. Uh, the worst one is, like I mentioned earlier, is uh, that the program works but it controls or reads the wrong device. Uh, that is uh, worse than a hard failure is because I may not know until something really bad happens. Uh, and if possible, I want devices to self-name themselves. I, I don't want to have to be, be administrator to do that because uh, it doesn't tend to scale well. And I need to know what the semantics are. Um, so one of the problems is that uh, we actually want both kinds of uh, permanence or consistency of naming. Namely, in some cases, we do need to um, be able to name a specific hardware unit uh, because that matters. I, we need to upgrade it or we need to I, I mean, do some device-specific maintenance function on it. Uh, and so we better be sure that it is a particular piece of hardware in that. In many cases, again, if I'm thinking of smart city or home or business building management or factory type application, I really do not care about the hardware device that is replaceable. Uh, I want to address a logical function uh, that I identified and the hardware of and where it's attached to the network, which network interface it uses, uh, that it uses now LoRa instead of uh, some other protocol, and just a sick fox uh, or 5G instead of 4G is of no interest to me. And indeed, I don't want to know about it because otherwise I have to upgrade my program every time any of these things change. So as the usual thing is, we need to think of a, a way of adding another layer of indirection. I, 
in not the usual way of solving computer science program. So it need again, some kind of directory. Again, WPC is starting to think about that a little bit in their kind of their thing uh, infrastructure in that, but it's a very centralized type of system. But in general, we need to something that maps programmer useful names to something that is device uh, closer to devices and networks in that. In that that becomes part of the infrastructure, just like, again, in most cases, we don't program other services based on IP addresses. So, 1 thing that I'm advocating for, and we've been exploring my group is to rely heavily on 1 of the common attributes of IoT systems, namely, I. Uh, that they all tend to have a geospatial component. They're attached to space and time uh, in many cases. I'm not so we do this in, in, in kind of at the consumer IoT level that we generally uh, identify devices by, say, a room. Um, and that seems to work well and has the independence requirements met in the sense that I can swap out devices and I can focus on function as opposed to the, uh, the device identity. So there is a number of ways of getting this type of data for devices. Uh, so we've been exploring a set of uh, underlying mapping services to put devices on a map, literally, in a generic way. Uh, so Google Maps, OpenStreetMaps, and floor plans, for example, and building management systems all have a mapping component uh, in that. So one of the things that we've been uh, playing around with is to automate the process so that devices that find themselves in buildings can automatically be mapped onto an OpenStreetMap uh, interface uh, in that by simply scanning and translating uh, uh, floor, relatively inaccurate floor plans, aligning them with the overall building outline. This is an open street map example of the building uh, that we used to be in before we all worked from home. And uh, that then can be mapped into a global context from a lo local context. Uh, so we have an automated workflow uh, that uh, allows us to take devices and make them visible on a map. So uh, we can now create a kind of two and a half D model uh, that has like an altitude range for information in addition to uh, the, the other uh, room and um, WGS 84 geo coordinates type of model, longitude latitude. So what, what might that look like? All right, this is a kind of a pseudocode model in this particular model is that from a programming interface, you would have a implied device discovery model or a, a sensor device might not actually map to a device. Uh, here I'm using a particular standardized way of identifying civic addresses, street addresses as opposed to a uh, physical G WGS 84 uh, addresses, because that's often easier to work with. So you really need both uh, in that. So this is the idea is you have, you want to find all the devices that are in a state of, uh, in the city of uh, Philadelphia and Pennsylvania in a particular business, and uh, you want to then do something uh, with those devices. And so that, is the kind of interface, even though there's a lot of things happening underneath, so to say, that would then uh, make the device identity and protocols completely invisible to the program. The programming model that is an, an alternate that I'll talk more about in the remaining time that I have is that you have a direct uh, SQL interface to the device without going kind of for just two level one where you identify the device itself and then you access the properties through more an object oriented style interface, uh, probably translated by a get or set or style model uh, in the um, underlying infrastructure in that to a direct um, version in SQL. 
And that leads to our current effort called SNSQL. So the idea, uh, which is actually a revival of an idea that was first explored about 20 years ago in very different circumstances uh, in the wireless sensor network community, is to look at uh, SQL as the interface for IoT applications. Uh, the reason we came to that kind of conclusion is that it is familiar to millions and millions of programmers. Every back-end web programmer at least knows enough SQL to do most queries, as in Bell, and they know how to do joins and, uh, and selects and updates and so on. It is reasonably standard, uh, as in, I mean, it's mostly portable unless you get Kind of really specific, I mean, we use some fairly obscure features, so you can port it across SQL implementation. It is reasonably easy for uh, people like data scientists to understand. Indeed, many data scientists have learned to use it uh, for a variety of applications. So even though they don't really program at a large scale, it is largely declarative uh, as opposed to kind of more implementation oriented. It doesn't expose uh, the interfaces, like network interfaces, to uh, the programmer. Uh, so all of these, I think, are quite helpful for large-scale IoT system. So what we do uh, in our system is we treat uh, the IoT system as a whole as a single SQL database but it is distributed across devices. And again, devices could mean gateways. It doesn't mean a light switch necessarily uh, in that. So whatever devices can implement reasonably some uh, SQL-like functionality and have a network interface clearly uh, in that. So we do a version of what in the database world is called sharding, uh, except we do it geographically. So usually when sharding is based on data, uh, segregation. Here, we uh, use the geographic spread uh, to create these queries uh, across the different one. And then we need to aggregate the responses for all these uh, uh, query results into a single table that is returned to uh, the uh, the program so that the program doesn't have to care that this is one IoT device versus multiple IoT device. So it is decentralized. Uh, we have no single point of failure. Uh, so it is fully distributed across devices. Uh, it is federated. These nodes can operate across multiple different administrative entities uh, with suitable privileges and restrictions. They may not give you access to the data. But in principle, there's nothing there that uh, requires us to be administered by that. And it integrates the notion of uh, both space and time. Uh, but we can use time series databases, or we can just have uh, timestamped data elements in the table itself. Uh, so the examples that you would program in that is you would very simply do queries such as find the maximum air pollution value in a particular location uh, near a particular geographic point along a road uh, in that and uh, similar examples in that, again, geographically one, all of which unify multiple IoT devices. So this is what this would look like. So a very common style analytics application that say a city uh, environmental uh, engineer might want to do, becomes a, a few lines of standard SQL in that. And the data analyst doesn't care whether the data is in some giant Oracle database that was already created for some other purpose, or in our case is gathered in real time from a distributed set of databases stored on the devices. The program looks exactly the same. We build the infrastructure to distribute the queries in the case of the second one that we care about, 
uh, we distribute the queries to these shards of a database automatically so we can gather the data in real time as opposed to kind of we suck up the data into a giant database and then do analysis for it. Again, I uh, just it's also one for you can use that for indoor type of applications as well. So this is what it looks like. I the we have these sub queries which are a number of sensors attached. I uh, typically be low level sensors I mean, computing low level sensors attached to a set of databases. Each one is an administrative domain. The ACPS is the administrative domain notion, and then we use an SQL proxy uh, that maps this into the uh, distributed databases model, and then we use Grafana for our prototype to show that. Uh, we have a mapping system that then attaches, so I know I need to know, because many of these queries are geographic, which databases should I contact? I don't want to contact every database in the world to do the query uh, in that, and then I'll get the data back from that. Uh, same notion. Uh, and again, uh, this is an example of uh, a measurement table I, I join where we use a variety of much fictitious data here where we then get the, uh, the, the data tables for these devices. So uh, we have a number of kind of thoughts that are, are not mature at this point. So currently, as in the earlier uh, Kind of early uh, work in the uh, wireless sensor in that community um, that it's largely select focus, so kind of equivalent of a get um, in that. But there might also be a uh, value to using um, updates and inserts into the table to have side effects essentially. Uh, that has risks associated with it, but it provides a way of exposing data and actions in ways that allow it to be shared across applications. So the idea is if you want to set an actuator for some uh, value uh, in that, you could do this as an insert into the table, which would actually make it happen and would then be visible to other uh, programs. So it would know what's what the setting is so that if you have competing control loops, for example, that's a relatively easy way of sharing state uh, and, that, and then synchronizing the real world to that. All right. We're thinking about how to integrate triggers uh, and MQTT events uh, in that uh, so that we can do uh, MQTT event notification uh, using that and then as to whether uh, time series databases uh, might be particularly helpful in this context. So again, I just wanted to kind of give credit where it's due. Uh, the notion of using databases is a, a relatively old one. Uh, they have been uh, efforts which largely seem to have kind of faded out of the popular kind of notion of what's available uh, for kind of what you could more mobile database managed systems all the way from very small ones like TinyDB to somewhat bigger ones. And indeed, if you look at my systems such as uh, SQLite uh, in that, that have a few hundred kilobytes of data of um, memory requirements or my things like device SQL that have about 50 kilobytes uh, in that. In, all of these mean that I believe that the database can actually be pushed down quite a bit. So about any device that has a bit more than Arduino functionality that has some semblance of an operating system uh, would be suitable for that. And I'd be an interesting discussion at some point to see uh, among the systems that you're working on as to how far down so to say this can go. So we are looking at a variety of issues, namely what's the sensor data model? Uh, how do we do event notification? How do we uh, discover the uh, administrative domains uh, registry um, model? How do we schedule uh, the SQL across multiple systems? Uh, we're building a prototype and what happens if a topology changes? So you made a query uh, and you want to know that new devices have popped up uh, available. Uh, when do you rerun the query to get new data? Um, I want to just 
and I want to leave I want to leave a minute or two for at least for some questions. Uh, so I'm not going to go into this in great detail, but I believe that there's actually also a com complementary necessary component to think about for the programming, namely how do we uh, specify who has access to what data. Uh, and IoT access control is much more complicated than what we're used to for traditional compute environments, where it's when basically you have a few bits literally per file, uh, your typical Unix permissions, where you have I mean, users, group, and world, and each one has like, I mean, I read, write, and execute type of settings. Here, Oh, and, and many practical IoT systems is we have more value-based uh, access control. So, I'm, for example, a room occupant uh, can set the temperature within kind of a reasonable human uh, tolerance level, but is not able to turn off the heat completely to prevent freezing or to and basically turn the room into a sauna uh, in that. But for a variety of reasons, maintenance per personnel should be able to do any of that because they need to. Uh, the same person uh, may have different privileges depending on where they are uh, for my safety and uh, my preventing accidents type of reasons. Uh, and that a person uh, in the office might be able to read the temperature from anywhere. So just make sure that the plants aren't dying. Uh, but I, they shouldn't necessarily set it from anywhere again to prevent accidents when somebody else might be using that room too uh, in that. And you might restrict the time resolution that you have for privacy reasons. So I might want to give people access to how busy a particular public space is, but I don't necessarily want to uh, have a um, minute by minute count to see if somebody is in that room, because that obviously could be used by, uh, say, a burglar to figure out when they can most readily break in or steal something. So we've been exploring geospatial access control uh, models in that. I, I simply because many pre-IoT control devices essentially operate geospatially. Now, your access control for your light switch in your room is essentially proximity only. There's no password, uh, no role-based access control. It is if you can touch it, you can control it. Go through that. Oop. And let me finish, wrap up. I'm I've been trying to make the point in general that we should think of programming models beyond just kind of a version of curl for co-op. Uh, as in, that's probably better than writing raw protocol API interfaces, but that's not the long-term perspective. What are good abstractions for these type of devices? Uh, we should think about these now as before large scale systems roll out. Because again, we've seen in the electric utility industry what happens if you don't do that. You have IP addresses you can't change anymore. Uh, many of our programmers will be people who are not programmers. Uh, that's not their job. Uh, they are amateurs, maybe good amateurs, smart amateurs, but they're amateurs. Where should this functionality reside? Should we suck up the data and store it in a big database? Should we do it on demand? Uh, how do we, one topic that I didn't deal with at all, my most, my assumption was that these were relatively simple scalar valued sensors largely, I mean, time series scalar valued in that sense, vectors, whatever, time vectors. Uh, they are not like, cameras that do some machine learning to do object detection or do more advanced functionality locally. They probably quite a different programming model in that. And finally, uh, we need a better model of access control than just simply kind of extending the traditional enterprise file style model uh, to IoT devices, simply because they tend to be more differentiated. And with that, I'll, I'll gladly take questions or our comments. Thank yeah, you. thank you very much, Henning, for this um, for this reflective uh, view at large on the IoT. I mean, it was much more than just a programming model. Um, 
for the procedures, um, uh, Matthias already posted to the chat. Um, please put a queue into the chat if you want to ask a question. If you want a question if read from the chat, put the question in the chat. Um, and until we are there, I start with a um, also a little bit uh, general question. You presented um, with a with the SQL approach. You presented a relational model, which I liked a lot uh, to access and process data. My my experience today is that a lot of um, let's say of the younger programmers are more in favor of uh, other models like hierarchical or key value stores or stuff like this. What is your experience with this? Yep, and that is, uh, I mean, they seem to be, and this is something where uh, this is almost a pendulum going back and forth where, I mean, for a while, uh, no SQL uh, things were all the range. You store everything as a JSON object uh, in that, uh, and, and don't worry about schemas anymore. And I certainly have, students, particularly kind of the undergraduate and master students that seem very much in that spirit because it uh, makes it easier to get started. I, mine, I'll point to, I think it was a paper that Google published about their evolution of a database infrastructure where they seem to have undergone kind of a, let's think about this again as we scale up model, namely that in many cases, uh, as you have more I, I mean, if you have a larger developer community, managing kind of a schema-less model becomes extremely challenging just from a system uh, consistency and maintainability perspective. Kind of a schema provides you with a common, relatively time invariant point of reference. So I'd argue that in many cases, uh, for large scale systems that maybe having a more constrained environment and a more self-documenting environment is helpful. Um, I would argue that this is a bit like uh, what we've been seeing the, with the initial fascination with um, a kind of typeless programming languages where mine like, I think, uh, my, uh, Perl or PHP or Python in its early versions. And all of those languages now seem to require typing, when TypeScript being the hot new thing. Uh, and uh, because of the notion that that helps you write more robust programs. So I'm not saying that we should not have, I'm not kind of what you said is we should explore these other options. Um, and I, my, what I would actually argue for is it would be really nice and a really one valuable research project to have essentially kind of common benchmark applications, maybe synthetic, maybe real, uh, of a large scale IoT system or smart city scale system, and see how that would look like in with different approaches. Again, that doesn't capture long-term maintainability, which I think is really the biggest issue to consider. Everything else is secondary uh, in that, but it would at least give us some idea as to the relative merits uh, on that. But man, I still see, even my kind of students that I, they all still learn SQL primarily because of a data science angle now. And it's just become, man, with Google BigQuery and, uh, and, and related products, this has really become uh, the interface even for uh, my people who are not developing traditional enterprise applications. Okay, thanks. We have another co completely different question from uh, um, oh, Jay Hunt. Uh, what kind of mechanism have you researched for the nodes to advertise themselves to the directory, like SRP V2 Bonjour, for instance, is the question. So this is uh, the rendezvous process. Yep, that's a good one. And we are still kind of thinking about this is namely, I, like I mentioned, uh, the Bonjour model, uh, we've actually used that uh, for some kind of more prototyping type work. Uh, the difficulty there that I have found is, again, because it, uh, the constraints don't seem to be uh, all that well uh, expressible. I, what I would like 
is something that allows me, uh, for example, to readily have the device self-discover its location, I advertise its capabilities in that. So kind of a version that is uh, more where it would export something like a thing description uh, in the W3C uh, model directly to that, but with location attached uh, to it, to the extent that you can self-discover that. That's obviously not always possible uh, in that. So I don't, I don't think Bonjour is quite the right level. Um, and not simply because I don't think it provides enough information for practical applications. So I'm working, for example, I will be talking to a large medical uh, device manufacturer this afternoon uh, about this general topic. And they have this problem. They have thousands and thousands of devices in the hospital. Um, and not my blood pressure monitors to EKG machines and uh, even bigger ones. Um, and a, they're very complex devices, and I don't think you can fit that into uh, Bonjour itself, but maybe a level of indirection will do. Okay. Um, well, thank you. Um, I, I did research on SLP V2 in 99 for a printer manufacturer. And um, huh. that was okay. like that the printers could advertise their capabilities and everything with themselves. So if the printer could find out where it was, then it could advertise itself to the SLP v2 directory via multicasting. And that could then, of course, be forwarded to the whole uh, global directory. Yep, I actually, now that you mentioned it, I do remember um, looking at that many years ago. Um, I do know this much better than I do. Is that still, that seems to have been an effort that never quite got enough traction. Uh, to yeah, be... <laughs> because it died after my graduation in my company, and then Apple came with Bonjour, and they built up on top of that. Yep, yep, and that's been because I, I now actually remember seeing this. I looked at this for in the voice of IP context for a, when a, a somewhat yeah. Uh, when advertising was by P terminals at some point, and but then it didn't quite seem to have that. Yeah, and much. and the big hurdle in the the early zeros was, of course, that you would need uh, multicasting on your network, and no network administrator would allow that. Yep, and that's actually, I mean, the Bonjour type of one is also that works really nicely for local networks. It is not obvious that that's necessarily the right model for say. I, Yes. A cellular uh, type of device, uh, not. Yeah, but okay. IPv6 should have solved everything with that. <laughs> yep, I, uh, I thought blockchains were supposed to solve everything. <laughs> <laughs> no, I am um, no. <laughs> okay, we have a, we have another question, um, a, a, more, a more technical one from Kerry Lynn, and that is about size constraints in, uh, in naming the. Uh, in the list of naming requirements, so size constraints on names is the question. Hmm, that's, let me maybe if uh, uh, Carrie Lynn could uh, elaborate a little bit. Are you talking about like when, uh, the, um, the size of a label or are you talking some other size constraints or uh, you're not? So uh, to paraphrase uh, Mark Twain, everybody's talking constraints, but nobody's doing anything about them. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, SLV2, uh, if I remember correctly, um, didn't really put any constraints on the size of the labels, uh, which of course is pretty impractical for IoT devices. Yep. And so, you know, I and and at times I've done this exercise of saying, well, you know, if we come up with this solution, we have a problem somewhere else. So it becomes kind of like a game of whack-a-mole sometimes with IoT. I, I think constrained engineering. All engineering has constraints, but I think IoT itself, you know, represents real challenges where you know all the solutions to all the problems you want to solve are kind of interrelated, and of course, you know, memory constraints and so forth. I think are primary in IoT. So, have you have you really thought about uh, in your naming strategies uh, some kind of upper bound on size that that would be permissible? Yep, and that's a good one. And this is where. The question that I have in my mind and generally more for the community really is, 
uh, where does the naming actually reside? Namely, so one model uh, that you can envision is that the device itself uh, has a non-human readable uh, identifier that has known persistency properties uh, in that, uh, in the sense that uh, it is defined by the name as to when it changes and when it does not change. So in some cases, that means that an administrator will have to actually physically move that name to the new device uh, that replaces an older device simply because only a human knows that this is the equivalent thing that it was before uh, in that kind of what we do for, say, a printer where we buy a new printer and give it the same name because we expect everybody to just use the new thing as if it was the old one, even if it's a different brand um, device uh, in that. And in some cases, uh, it will be really that uh, and, and will be a thing that is attached to a physical identity, as in if the hardware gets swapped out, the name changes, and you update a directory with that explicitly. You don't worry about persistence. The directory, um, it's the job of a directory to do that. And then, then in that case, uh, if you do that, then the name length is no longer um, based on programmer requirement. It is based on um, requirements for my just sim simple, um, sorry here. I, it's based on simple kind of technical, you can impose whatever constraints that are sufficient to create a unique name because you don't expect the programmer to use it. I think that's actually a more productive approach is to have uniqueness assured in some randomized way as opposed to uh, in my, by some random identifier as opposed to uh, kind of an, a, a descriptive identifier simply because the latter still has these uncertainties as to persistency and uh, what does it actually identify? I mean, what can change, what are the invariants that you can have for the name to stay the same uh, in that. So I'm actually more leaning towards not naming things directly at the device level, but uh, not exposing any of these low level things to the higher level. And that's actually one reason why I think IPv6 and maybe even kind of uh, my hash based names, like in some of the uh, blockchain models, are useful because they're so unwieldy that nobody wants to use them in the program. IPv4 addresses are just <laughs> pleasant enough for programmers that they are tempting nuisance uh, to stick in programs. To, to push your SQL analogy, you might think of this as something like a foreign key that points to a yes. row in a database. Yep, that's actually a good analogy in that. Uh -huh. Yeah, I do want to address one question that I'm seeing that is really an interesting one, and uh, namely uh, the ICN question uh, in that. And so I, and I think it suffered, and this is actually, uh, this is really good kind of, I hadn't thought of it in this context, but it is clearly uh, an illustration of the same constraint uh, issue that I, mean, I think I've been discussing in a different context just for data objects more specifically in that. Uh, where I see kind of the two, uh, put it politely, challenges for an ICN model is uh, it assumes that there is a single constant name for something and that is meaningful uh, in that. And that already is challenging for web-like content uh, because we know that we have at least, if you think of it as uh, a web model, we have two, we have an equivalent challenge in that environment, namely that uh, we sometimes want to name a particular instance, uh, as in like a hash of a uh, content in that, uh, that I mean, a sequence of bytes that we want to reference. So this is why we have I mean, this curious convention in uh, when we cite web pages last accessed on so that essentially be kind of an equivalent of a time hash on in that so that we refer to a particular instance and in some cases we don't care 
um, as in we have, uh, we want the front page of a newspaper, which is different every few minutes and, uh, or we don't care that the same YouTube video has different advertising videos spliced in. Uh, so it's different content even in that. And the naming schemes that I mean, the ICN model, if you were to extend that often doesn't really make that clear. Um, and that I would also argue, and this is again, one of layer separation, uh, just like I said for IoT, instead of embedding this into the infrastructure, I, I believe you can do what you want to do with an ICN model if you want to name content and if you actually know what that means of identifying content or services for that matter. I, then I, the notion often the level of query you want is at a higher level than a simple key value store. It is really properties uh, that you want. Uh, languages in the web case, say, for example, or renderings for mobile devices versus non-mobile devices, uh, access privileges uh, that might give you different levels of detail or different levels of content based on what you do. Uh, all of that is really a higher level construct. And I would argue that trying to push this down into the stack is actually means that you don't get the functionality. Uh, and since multicast was mentioned, I mean, multicast as at least a wide area one largely died simply because it didn't offer the content distribution functionality that people actually wanted, access control and differentiation and scaling and all of that. Uh, and so we ended up doing multicast via CDN, application layer multicast, if you want to call it that, simply because the lower level one just didn't do it. And my fear is that ICN still has all the same problems, namely it is too, it doesn't provide the richness of expressiveness for naming that when I discussed in the IoT case. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we are a little bit short on time. Um, is that is, is there one pressing question um, which we could address? Okay, um, then I guess we should uh, um, conclude here with this session because we are actually, we are 15 minutes late. Uh, thank you again all. Thank you Henning for this uh, inspiring uh, uh, session talk, discussion. Uh, and I, I guess we have taken a lot from this. And um, yeah, we see Thank you everyone. Uh, and you know where to find me. So I would particularly, again, this is work in progress and lots of you know related work uh, that was done in many cases some number of years ago, but is worth re revisiting under new circumstances. Uh, and so I very much, uh, like to continue the discussion because uh, you have collectively have a kind of background knowledge and experiences that uh, could really help kind of think this through a bit more uh, in that beyond. Again, thank you for the opportunity and I, I look forward to, um, I'm, I'll definitely look at some of the papers that I saw in, in the presentation. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, again, we, we are having 15 minutes break now, uh, which can be joined into Gathertown as Matthias put the chat, uh, uh, put in the chat the link. And then we, we resume at uh, um, 1.30 uh, UTC.